Welcome back. Welcome back to the Free Melon Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining me. I am Eli Martyr. And for this episode of the podcast, what I wanted to do is actually something that I'm interested in doing for many episodes of this podcast. What I'd like to get into is I'd like to read you an excerpt from a book. Now, the backdrop for my uh, for my Free Melon Society lectures and videos, I, I have my home library. And I think what I want to do with this podcast is I want to get into things that I just don't as often get to on my channel, which is literally just read you and turn this into a story time and read you excerpts of books, either entire chapters or particular sections or pages so that you can get an idea and a feel of what that book would be like to hopefully entice you to either get it yourself and read it yourself. And yeah, I thought that would be something that was worthwhile because, well, sometimes we just don't have time to read <laughs> absolutely every, every single book under the sun. And yeah, if I can, if I can help by giving the general feel of a certain book or of a certain section, then that's something that's worthwhile doing. So what I'd like to do today is I'm going to read you a section from a book. I, I think I'll read you the full first chapter here. And this book is called um, Initiation, The Perfecting of Man. It's by Annie Besant. And if you either Google or YouTube the name Annie Besant, you're going to find a lot of information. You're also going to find a lot of fudge and feces thrown on <laughs> this woman because she did run in occult circles. She did run in the esoteric philosophy, um, the, the mystery teachings, the esoteric religious teachings. And a lot of the information that is thrown at her uh, attempts to smear her name. And I find a lot of it kind of immature in the sense that they it seems that because she was associated with certain individuals and certain groups that they kind of labeled her a certain thing without actually reading the material that she that she gives it seems to me that that must be the case because i or if you have a certain particular religious, pious religious bent, if you have a certain religious air about you, then what's in her material is going to conflict with the dogmatic religious teachings of the institutionalized religions, for sure. But if anyone of, a, of an open mind, I think, goes through the material themselves and just really kind of lets the idea sink in and, and sit with you, you'll find that she isn't really coming from any particular place of evil. It's more just information. It's just, it's knowledge. And like many things, it's how that knowledge is applied that um, gives the result, gives the nature of the result. And of course, this information can be used for ill or it can be used for good. So I think it, it does come down to a little bit of maturity, <laughs> as with all things in life, in how we deal with information, with raw information that is given to us. Because raw information is not in itself inherently good or evil. It is simply the application of that information that determines the outcome. So without further ado, I believe I'm going to read to you chapter one of The Initiation, The Perfecting of Man. Um, and if you allow me, I'm going to add context and I'm not, I, I won't just do a straight reading. I, I'm definitely going to feel like adding uh, my own little comments here or there just to help uh, add some context. And I'll let you know when I'm, when I'm doing that. So let's get into this. So this is chapter one, the man of the world. And the subtitle is his first steps. Okay. In fact, what I should say is that, you know what? No, I won't say anything. No, I, I won't give you, I won't prepare you with any pretext or whatnot. I, I'll just, I'll just read it and let you come to your 
own conclusions, kind of, because I do want to add context here or there. Anyway, all right, let's get on with this. The man of the world, his first steps. There is a path which leads to that which is known as initiation. And through initiation, to the perfecting of man, a path which is a path which is recognized in all the great religions and the chief features of which are described in similar terms in every one of the great faiths of the world. You may read of it in the Roman Catholic teachings as divided into three parts. One, the path of purification or purgation. Number two, the path of illumination. And three, the path of union with divinity. You find it among the Muslims and the Sufi, the mystic, teaching, uh, the mystic teachings of Islam, where it is known under the names of the way, the truth, and the life. You find it further eastward, still in the great faith of Buddhism, divided into subdivisions, though these can be classified under the broader outline. It is similarly divided in Hinduism, for both those great religions in which the study of psychology of the human mind and the human constitution has played so great a part, you find a more definite subdivision. Readers aside, I just want to add, for those of you who have been paying attention in the 21st century, you may have noticed the absolutely crushing wave of Islamic terrorism going on all over the world. And when she says, you find it among the Muslims and the Sufi, the mystic teachings of Islam, you might find it hard to reconcile that, that fact that, that I just read here with the fact that there is this crushing wave of Islamic terrorism going on all over the world, right? So how do you how do you reconcile those two things? How could the path of purification, illumination, and the path of union with divinity be inherent in Islam when it seems that Islam is is doing nothing but evil, right? And seems to be you know backwards, uh, in the, the insane oppression of women, childhood genital mutilation, uh, the vast majority of the Islamic teachings in the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith, all being how to more effectively and efficiently destroy the Kafir. The Kafir in, in Islamic teaching being anyone non-Muslim. So waging war on anyone that's non-Muslim is the, is the highest prerogative, is the highest goodness in Islam. And, you know, there's going to be people that say, oh, but that's just spiritual warfare. They're talking about spiritual warfare. Uh, yeah, well, you, you should actually read what is in the text and you come to a very starkly different conclusion. Uh, it, it, is, it is not just a spiritual context. They're talking about straight up, you know, physical murder and, and uh, subjugation. Anyway, it, it, that's a subject for a different story, uh, for a different time. But what I want to stress is that the exoteric branch, okay, the branch of Islam that is meant for public dissemination in the hopes that the public en masse adopts this and makes them ripe for complete top-down control, that is what you find in the general exoteric public branch of Islamic teaching. This is no different than, I'm not, I'm not picking on Islam, I'm talking about all of the religions, I'm talking about Christianity as well, Catholicism, there is an exoteric, external public branch meant for public consumption. What Annie Besant here is talking about, is she is talking about the esoteric branch of Islam. She's talking about the branch that is reserved for the initiate class alone, not reserved or not intended for public consumption. Okay. Only the selected few who are mentally prepared get this teaching. So that is how you can reconcile what, she, with, uh, what she's saying with the fact that she's talking about Islam in general. She's not talking about the esoter uh, exoteric branch of Islam that you see in, you know, Islamic terrorism and whatnot. She is not talking. She's not talking about the Islamic system that you find in the regular institutionalized branch of Islam. She's not talking about that at all. She's talking about the 
esoteric class that you cannot find in the public sphere. Okay, I just wanted to make that very clear. So let's pick up again where I left off. Continuing on, but really, it matters not which faith you turn. It, sorry, it matters not to which faith you turn. It matters not to which particular set of names you choose as best attracting or expressing your own ideas. The path is but one. Its divisions are always the same. From time immemorial, that path has stretched from the life of the world to the life of the divine. Through thousands upon thousands of years, some of our human race have trodden it. For thousands and thousands of years, which are yet unborn, some of our race shall tread it to the end of our earth story, to the conclusion of this special cycle of human time. It is the path which, stage by stage, enables man to fulfill the command of the Christ. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. It is the path whereof that same great teacher declared, Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, oh, and few there, uh, few there be that find it. I know that in latter days, when most men had forgotten the existence of the path, they changed those true words into words that are utterly false, that make the gate and the way narrow that lead unto a heavenly life, and broad and wide the way that leadeth to an everlasting condemnation. But that is a distortion of the occult teaching. It is a twisting of the words of Christ, for surely he, whom his followers call the Savior of the world, could never have declared that only few should be the ranks of the saved, practically numberless the crowds of the lost. In dealing with the path, we are not in those regions of exoteric faith which speak of heaven and hell. The life to which the path leads the pilgrim is not the life of the passing joys of heaven. It is that life spoken of in the fourth gospel, where it is written, The knowledge of God is eternal life. Life which is not counted by endless ages, but which means a change in the attitude of the man. Which means not time, but a life that is beyond time which is not counted by the rising of, and setting of suns, even though, even though those dawns and sunsets were in an immortal life, but which means that perfect serenity, that unity with God, in which time is only a passing incident of existence and an ever-present reality is understood as the true life of the Spirit. And so the path that we are to study through the coming Sundays through these brief and poor descriptions of what that path may mean to man, is the short, is the short though difficult way by which man evolves more rapidly than in the ordinary course of human and natural evolution. It is the path by which, to use a simile often used, instead of going round and round the mountain by an ever climbing spiral, Man climbs the straight up uh, man climbs straight up the mountainside, regardless of cliff and precipice, regardless of gulf and chasm, knowing there is nothing that can stop the eternal spirit, and that no obstacle is stronger than the strength that is omnipotence, because it has its source its source in omnipotence itself. Let me give a, a readers aside. Let me give a very, very brief encapsulation. She is saying that there is a certain way of life that you can live that will plummet you to the top of the mountain much faster than the normal casual way of living, which kind of takes you on this uh, circulatory path, an extended, a protracted path along the mountainside, spiraling, spiraling upward. Okay, shortest distance from point A to B is a straight line. Okay, and you can take that line if you choose, or you can choose otherwise and just spiral and spiral and spiral and make the path journey and journey long and arduous. Okay, continuing on, such is the path then that you and I are to try to study not for the mere interest of what is indeed a fascinating and enthralling subject, 
but rather at least on the part of the speaker, and I hope on the part of some at least of the hearers, a study that is meant to change the life, a study that gives birth to a determination to tread the path, to know it not only theoretically, but by practical realization, and to understand something of those hidden mysteries by which man, ever potentially divine, realizes his inner divinity and becomes perfect, rising above and beyond humanity. Such is the scope, then, of our study. And in order that, that the study may be practical, we must assume, at least for the time, the existence of certain great facts of nature. I do not mean that our man of the world, in taking his first steps towards the path, need either know or recognize these facts. This part is very important, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to pay very close attention. Facts in nature do not change either with our believing or non-believing. Facts of nature remain facts whether we know them or not. And since we are here in the realm of nature and under the order of law, the knowledge of these facts and the knowledge of the law are not essential steps, uh, essential for the steps which lead man to the path. It is enough that the facts are there and that the man unconsciously is allowing those facts to influence his inner and his outer life. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, readers aside, this is so important to know. Nature does not give two craps whether you are aware of her laws or not. All she cares about is whether those laws are being exercised or whether they are not, whether they, they're being adhered to, or whether they are being ignored, whether they, they're being abided by or being broken. And depending on what you choose, you will get the results, you will get the consequences or the products of that behavior. It makes no difference whether you believe it or not, okay? I, I can't, I can't, whether you're aware of it or not, okay, you are under the strict binding, exacting law of nature's hand, of nature's divine hammer. She was, she will always be subjecting you to these laws. Okay. Now you can be oblivious or not. That's your choosing. But because you're always under the law, you might as well study it and become aware of it and know what laws are applying to you every single day. The laws that are applying to your thought and your behavior every single day whether you like it or not. You might as well learn about them because you're under their, 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 you're being subjected to them. So it behooves you to take in this material. And this is what I talk about. This is what I try to get across to my audience all the time on the Free Melon Society on YouTube. I, I, I talk about natural law because it, I mean, there's just nothing more important to learn, right? So it, you, you know, you, you know, got to know who you are. You have to understand what your body is, what it's designed to do. Uh, these are very important things if you want to live in this world of culture where we're bamboozled by lies and deception 24-7. Uh, wow, I, I really get on a spiel. Uh, i got to stop myself sometime. Okay, uh, let's, let's get on here. Uh, continuing. I'm not even sure where I left off. Okay, here we go. Continuing on. Sunshine does not cease to warm you because you may not know anything of the constitution of the sun. <laughs> Quite obvious. <laughs> as, as many natural law teachings are, they're, they're just so obvious, so common sense, because truth is immediately apprehendable by anyone listening. <laughs> Fire does not cease to burn you because unknowing its fierceness, you thrust your hand into the flame. <laughs> it is the security of human life and human progress that the laws of nature are ever working and carrying us on with them, whether we know of them or not. But if we know them, we gain a great advantage. If we know them, we can cooperate with them. Cooperate with them as we cannot cooperate as long as we are in the darkness of ignorance. <laughs> if we know the facts, we can utilize them. 
as we cannot utilize them when we know not they are there. To know is the difference between walking in the darkness and in the light, and to understand the laws of nature is to gain the power of quickening our evolution by utilizing every law that hastens our growth. By avoiding the working of those that would retard and delay. Now, one of the great facts which underline the whole possibility of a path of human perfecting that I must take for granted throughout the lectures, for to deal with it as a matter, of, uh, as a matter for argument would lead us far away from our subject. One of the fundamental facts in nature is the fact of reincarnation. That means the gradual growth of man through many lives, through many experiences of the physical world, of the intermediate world, and also of the world called heaven. Evolution would be too short to enable a man to grow from imperfection to perfection, unless he had many opportunities, a long, uh, a long road to lead him upward. And our man of the world who will take the first steps who is ready to take them, must have behind him a long, long course of human evolution in which he has learned to choose the good and reject the evil. Let me say that again. Choose the good and reject the evil, in which his mind has been evolved, evolved, and trained. His character has been built up from the ignorance and non-moral non state of the savage to the point where the civilized man is standing today. Did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? The non-moral state of the savage to the point where the civilized man is standing today. The fact of reincarnation, then, is taken for granted, for not one of us could possibly tread the whole of that long course could reach the divine perfection in the limits of a single life. But our man of the world need not know of reincarnation. He knows it in his spiritual memory, although his physical brain may not yet have recognized it, and his past, which is a fact, will push him onwards until spirit and brain are in fuller communication, and that which is known to the man himself becomes known in the concrete mind. The next great fact, necessary and taken for granted, may be put into a single phrase of your own scriptures. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It is the law of causation, the law of action and reaction, by which nature brings inevitably to the man the results of that which he has thought, which he has desired, and which he has done. I really hope you took that in. So uh, let's uh, pause for one second, readers aside. In, in seeking for initiation, for the improvement of a higher life, for, for, in order to evolve yourself to a, to a higher level, the elements, the elements that the initiate must understand as a, as a building block are one, the existence of re reincarnation, and two, the existence of another natural law of cause and effect of causality. So, so far, those are the two main points that we've gone over. Okay. All right. Carrying on. Next, the facts are that there is a path and that men have trodden it before us, that the swifter evolution is possible, that the laws of it may be known, they may be known, the conditions of it understood, the stages of it be trodden, and that, and that at the end of that path, there are standing those who once were men of the world, but now are the guardians of the world, the elder brethren of our race, the teachers and the prophets of the path, stretching upwards in ranks of ever more dazzling light from the ending of the path for man to the highest ruler of the world in which we live. Poor would be our hope if none before us had trodden the way, if none had walked upon the path. But they who in the past have come as teachers have in an earlier past accomplished this mighty pilgrimage. 
Those whom today we honor as masters exist in touch with the world that may take the pupils and guide them in the treading of the path. These are the great facts in nature, existing, whether recognized or not, on which the possibility of treading the path depends. Reincarnation, the law of karma, the fact of the path, readers aside, meaning that you have to know that the path exists. Continuing on, the, and the existence of the teachers. Those are the four facts I must take for granted. Not saying that they may be not, not saying that they may not be shown to be true by argument one after the other, but for the purpose of this course, taking them for granted. Because without each of them, the very lectures themselves themselves would be impossible. What steps then is our man of the world to take, or what steps is he taking if he is really approaching the entrance to the beginning of the path? I have said that he need not know the four great truths I have mentioned. He need not understand them or recognize them. That is part of the hopeful side of the subject. That there may be nay, there will, oh sorry, that there may be, nay, there will be many among you who do not yet know the truth of these things, but yet in the course of evolution are treading onwards towards the entrance to the path. And though in time to come you will know more fully, though unconsciously you are evolving, nonetheless. The evolution is a fact. And what I want to do this morning is to show you those steps that you may be able to consider your own lives and judge whereabout you stand, that you may be able to decide each for himself, of himself whether or not his face is turned in the direction of the path, for there are many among you who are going in the direction, albeit you know it not, while there are some who, having studied and understood and deliberately turning their faces in that direction, to turn your evolution from being unconscious to being conscious, to enable you to understand yourselves and where you are, that is the purpose of the first of these lectures, so that those amongst you who believe in the path may know how to live, and that those who unknowingly are approaching it may, perchance, realize the happiness of their lot. The first step of all, absolutely necessary, without which no approach is possible, by which achievement ever comes within reach of realization, may be summed up in, the four, uh, in four brief words. The service of man. There is the first condition. The sin qua non. For the selfish, no such advance is possible. For the unselfish, such advance is certain. And in whatever life the man begins to think more of the common good than of his own individual gain, whether it be in the service of the town or of the community, of the nation, of the wider joinings of nations, to, uh, together, right up to the service of humanity itself, every one of those is a step towards the path and is preparing the man to set his feet thereon. And there is no distinction here between the kinds of service provided, uh, service provided they are unselfish, strenuous, moved by the, by the ideal to help and serve. It may be purely intellectual. The work of the writer and the author, trying to spread amongst among others the knowledge he has found, in order that the world may be a little wiser, a little more understanding because that man has lived and written. It may be along the service of art, wherein the musician, the painter, the sculptor, the architect, puts before himself the ideal of making the world a little fairer and more beautiful, life a little more sweet, more full of grace and culture for humankind. It may be along the way of social service, where the man, moved by sympathy for the poor, the suffering, pours out his life in the work of helping, tries to alter the constitution of society where it needs amendment, tries to change the environment where the environment of the past, useful in the past, has become an um, anachronism and is preventing the better progress that humankind should today, should today environment. What? 
the is preventing the better progress that humankind should today environment i think she's using the word environment as a verb there it may be along the way of political work where the life of a nation internal and external is the object of service it may be along the way of healing where the doctor tries to bring <laughs> doctor uh, where the doctor tries to bring health in the place of disease and to make conditions good for the body in order that the body may be healthier and longer lived than otherwise it would be um, readers aside if that is what you'd like I suggest that you not go to a doctor okay reading on I cannot give you one by one the numerous divisions of the way of service anything that is of value to human life is included on that way choose then what way you will because of your capacities and your opportunities it matters not as regards the treading of the first steps commerce industry anything of use to man production distribution they all come within the service uh, within service for man and supply man's necessities but will but you will say that everyone is engaged in one or the other i have mentioned or in similar avocations in life that is true oh i have mentioned or in similar avocations in life okay that is true because the way to the path is set in human life and there is nothing necessary for the growth and evolution of that life which may not be made a step towards the path but the difference lies in the conditions of the work truly men follow all these ways and many more they produce they distribute they take part in industry or commerce they are writers, artists, politicians, social reformers, doctors, what you will. But with what object and moved by what motive? There lies the difference between the man who is on the ordinary road of evolution, growing by his work or his study, and the man who, while growing, is growing with the object of service. Of service, of lifting the world a little higher, and not only of earning his livelihood therein. So, uh, readers aside, what she's saying is, it doesn't matter what you're doing in life, it is the spirit in which you are doing it, which is important. It is the, it is the, the feeling, the underlying tenor of emotion, uh, of, of feeling that is necessary, right? And, and if you're doing it out of love for the service of others around you, of the world, that is that is important or, or are you doing it for purely selfish motivations for reasons uh, which will detract you for, will lead you away from the path <clears throat> okay continuing on i am not speaking with any idea of looking down upon or with contempt for those who are merely walking in the ways of the world with the ordinary worldly objects that is a part and a necessary part of evolution right how should man evolve his mind? How should man train his emotions? How should man develop even physically, unless he considers the ways of the world and makes efforts to succeed therein? It is well that men should work for the fruit of action. Well that men should struggle in order to succeed. Well that men should be ambitious, should grasp after power and place, after fame, honor, and success. Toys, yes, they are toys, but they are the toys by which the children learn to walk, the prizes in life's school by which the boys are stimulated to exertion, the crowns in the struggle of life by which strength and energy and future possibilities are developed. Do not despise the common world of men, in which men are striving and struggling, making many error and many a blunder, committing many a sin and even a crime, for all these are lessons in life's school. All these are stages through which every man must pass. As the fierce struggle in the world of the brute develops strength and cunning and the power to guard the life, so do the fierce struggles among men develop the power of the will, the power of the mind, the power of the emotions, even the power of muscle and nerve. In a world which springs from infinite wisdom 
and infinite love, there is no lesson in life that has not its purpose. And in all the prizes of the world, call them from the higher standpoint toys as you may, in all the fruits of action which in the higher life you are bidden to renounce and to cast aside, in every one of these God is hiding. In every one of them, his, attra uh, his attractiveness is the only power that allures, and, though they break into pieces when you have uh, grasped them, although ambition turns to ashes when it is satisfied, although wealth becomes a burden when it is gathered, although pleasure becomes satiety after it has filled the cup of delight, <laughs> still the breaking is another lesson, the lesson that you may remember was exquisitely put by the Christian poet George Herbert. Uh, and this is the excerpt by George Herbert. When God at first made man, having a glass of blessings standing by, let us, said he, pour on him all we can. Let the world's riches, which dispersed lie, contract into a span. So strength first made away, then beauty flowed, then wisdom, honor, pleasure. When almost all was out, God made a stay, perceiving that alone of all his treasure, rest in the bottom lay. For if I should, said he, bestow this jewel also on my creature, he would adore it, he would adore my gifts instead of me, and rest in nature, not the God of nature. So both should losers be. Yet let him keep the rest, but keep them with repining restlessness. Let him be rich and weary, and that, at least, if goodness lead him not, yet weariness may toss him to my breast. Okay, continuing on in the book. There is the great truth of at once the value and the worthlessness of human life, the valuable because it brings out the faculties without which no progress is possible. Worthless because everything breaks into pieces and leaves the hands empty till at last they grasp the feet of God. There then is the worth of the ordinary life, and our man of the world has begun to realize that, it not, that not in seeking pleasure, wealth, and honor for himself can permanent joy be found, but in the service of his fellow men, in the helping of the miserable, the teaching of the ignorant, the uplifting of the oppressed, the lightening of the sorrow of the poor. And many there are among you today who are well off and comfortable, whose hearts are heavy for the sorrow of the world, and who cannot rest in your comfort, in your luxury, while others are starving, miserable, crushed under the burden of life. Oh, the waking of the social conscience among us, the recognition of social duty, of social responsibility, is the noblest sign of, evolution, of the evolution of man, and proof of the coming of the new race that shall have sympathy instead of indifference. Sympathy instead of indifference. Cooperation instead of competition as its rule in the outer life of man. Um, readers aside here, do not think that the world revolutionary socialist movement, the world communist movement, has anything to do with what she's talking about. Make no mistake. Okay, I do not want my listeners to think that just because I said the word uh, social responsibility, social duty, that Annie Besant here is talking about socialism and as it is constructed in the political scenario. Okay, she is not talking about that. Okay, <laughs> so just want to be extremely clear about that. Uh, reading on. And, ugh, sorry, I, I guess I should, I should say, um, socialism and creeping communism is a weapon, is a, pol a political weapon that is used to slowly exact complete dominant control from the, from the few, from the wealthy rich few to the, uh, against the many. It is, it is, it is a, a tyrannical weapon that is sold to you as a social boon, as a benefit. Uh, but really is a hidden form of complete tyranny. So um, that, that's, that's just something you should know. Um, we can get into that another, another day. <clears throat> and as that spreads and grows, 
more and more men of the world will tread these early steps. But it must be strenuous, not the passing feeling of compassion that makes you out of your superfluity give you uh, give what you never miss to some good cause or some unhappy family. Not the throwing aside of some luxuries you have in order that others may have more of the necessities of life. Much more than that is demanded from you. <laughs> Oh, you would tread toward the entrance to the path. Oh, who, uh, sorry. Oh, you who would tread towards the entrance of the path. Uh, readers aside, she's saying if you're a billionaire and you've got a couple extra dollars and some change in your car and you just, you know, give a couple pieces of spare change to, you know, to the, to the bum, to the homeless, uh, that's not necessarily treading the path, right? She's saying, if you've got an abundance of superfluity, you know, giving some scraps to people is not necessarily treading the path, okay? Uh, anyway, continuing on. You must give yourself, and not only what you possess, and in that there is an immensity of a difference. You must feel the sorrow of others as you feel your own pain. You must feel the grief of others as you would feel the piercing of your own heart. It must come to you as an intolerable good, a uh, goad to action, excuse me, that presses you along the way of service, which you cannot des deny nor resist. You find people amongst you like that, people who cannot rest. It is not making sacrifices that lies behind them. Oh, that lies behind them. The thing the world calls sacrifices are their delights they they joy to give themselves it is only a sacrifice in the sense that the life spirit is ever flowing out to others but that is a but that is joy and not sorrow delight and not pain involuntary almost a necessity of life and where you see that passion of service where you see that willingness to give everything up that others may be happier, where you, see, where you see people ever thinking what they can do to help, whom they can find to serve, who there is near them, to whom they can render help, it may be within the circle of the family or in the larger circle of the public life. But it may be the constant resolute endeavor to give everything away that others may profit. There you have made manifest the inner spirit who only lives to pour himself out and finds the satisfaction in the service of man. There, then, is the first great step. And wherever you see that, the person is approaching the path. Though he may never have heard of it, he is coming towards the masters. Though he knows not that they exist, there are some who are still in the twilight of unbelief in the spiritual life, who are nearer the entrance to the path than many so-called religious men, <laughs> who know the theory of religion but do not follow its practice. And there is one thing of the true of the uh, one thing true of the value of the training of passing through a period of materialism. That in that there is absolutely no reward, no talking about the joys of heaven. Nothing about he that hath pity on the poor lendeth to the Lord, and lo, what he layeth out, in sh uh, it shall be paid him again. In the life of the unbeliever, he sacrifices himself for man, and has no reward to look to, no return of outpoured riches to expect, and in that he gains a perfection of the sacrifice of the lower self, that many in an earnest Christian, Buddhist, or Hindu might envy him. In his depth and reality of in his depth and reality of life. There is an old friend of mine, 21 years passed away, whom some of the elder ones among you remember under the name of Charles Bradlaugh. There you have a man who had no belief in the life of the other side of death, who, dying, remained with the idea that death for him ended everything that nothing was left save any work he might have done for men. And I know of no more spiritual statement, aggressive atheist as he was, than a passage that he uttered when he spoke of the citadel of human liberty and happy happiness, that in the future he hoped humanity might reach. Though he believed he would never see it for himself, 
Enough for me, he said. If my body falling into the ditch that keeps humanity from its future may act as a bridge over which others may tread to the happiness that I shall never see. The man who could say such words with depth, with the depth of belief that distinguished all which was his was a man who was taking his, uh, the first steps to the path, which in another life most surely he will find. Learn, then, that the service demanded is that unselfish service that gives everything and asks for nothing in return. And you, and if you find that in you it is a necessity of your nature, not a choice, but an overmastering impulse, then you may sh be sure that you are one of the men of the world who are taking the first steps towards the path. Uh, just pausing for a moment here, just checking my time. Okay, great. I need hardly say that when I say men, I mean women too. But I cannot keep on saying man and women each time as it makes such difficulty with the pronouns. And for the ultra hardcore feminists out there, know the use of the word men, of the pronoun men, to encompass all of humankind and humanity, both men and female, uh, men and women. No, this is not a sexist term. <laughs> Take that, then, as the first and most vital step, and there is, an other, uh, there is another that may strike you as a little strange, and yet it is true. The man who can become possessed by an idea, so that no argument, no personal advantage, none of the reasons which influence ordinary men can turn him away from the following of that idea, that man is coming near to the path. The great Indian psychologist Patanjali, who wrote certain axioms of yoga, described in these the stages of the life of man through which the mind of man passed. And he said there was the butterfly stage, the stage of the child in which the mind ran from one thing to another as the butterfly hovers over the flowers, taking a little honey here and there, ever changing the objects it turns to, seeking pleasure, amusement, des uh, delights everywhere. That butterfly mind, he said, is far from yoga. And then there was the mind of youth, as he considered it, the mind that is impulsive under the sway of the emotions, rushing everywhere, possessed as it were for a moment with an idea, but then possessed with another, more steady than the butterfly mind, but still varying in direction, although holding strongly for the time. That, he said, is far from yoga. There was... <coughs> going through puberty. There was then the stage when the mind became possessed by an idea, obsessed, if you like, but so gripped and held that nothing could turn aside the man from its following. Now, if that idea be a true idea, turning to the service of man, consonant with natural law, such an idea possessed man, uh, such an idea possessed, oh, such an idea possessed man is near to the entrance to the path. I am not forgetting that the fixed idea may be the fixed idea of the maniac. <laughs> but then it is a false idea, not a true one. Then it disregards... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the maniac. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry. This is quite the unprofessional uh, audiobook reading, I guess. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, then it disregards the law of laws of nature, is not in accord and in harmony with the law of evolution, which is the law of progress. But in studying the maniac, <laughs> but in studying the maniac with his, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so unprofessional. Uh, <laughs> but in studying the maniac with his fixed idea. You may gain some light on what, is, what it means when we say a man is possessed by, by an idea. You, I've still got a smile on my face. Oh, God. I'm human. Uh, I don't like rigid professionalism, as you can see. Um, you see it in enthusiasts, in heroes, in martyrs. Hey, in martyrs! Woo! 
That is my last name, ladies and gentlemen. That is not a stage name. Martyr is actually my last name. Um, when a man like Arnold von, oh boy, uh, Winkelried, Arnold von Winkle, Winkelried rushed upon the pikes of the enemy and drew as many as he could into his arms and turned the points into his own bosom, my goodness, in order that a gap may be made in the opposing force through which his comrades might pass when he lay dead on the ground, he was possessed with the idea of helping his country. And when it was a question of his country's liberty, love of life, fear of pain, that influence, though that influence ordinary men, had no power to change him. Um, let me read that one more time because my inflection was a little off and it might have given you some confusion. Um, okay. In order that a gap may be made in the opposing force through which his comrades might pass when he lay dead on the ground, he was possessed with the idea of helping his country. And, when it was a question of his country's liberty, love of life, fear of pain, that inf uh, love of life and fear of pain that influence ordinary men had no power to change him. Here we go. And so, with the martyr, the man who dies rather than tell what he believes to be a lie. It does not so much matter whether he is right or wrong. Many men have been martyred for what they believed to be true, but which was an error. <laughs> That matters not so far as this possession is concerned. When a man so believes a thing to be true, that it is easier for him to die than to deny his truth, the man deserves the name of martyr. And the crown of martyrdom is a knowledge afterwards of the truth. It is the attitude of the man that matters. It will take another point which will show you that I am not putting this merely as thinking of things, I'm not putting this merely as thinking of things with which I thoroughly agree myself. One of the burning questions of the day is the policy which is being followed now by the extreme party in women's suffrage. On that policy, it is no duty of mine to express an opinion when I am not taking part in a thing. I never judge those who are facing a danger that I do not share. But I say it does not matter whether the people concerned honestly in that are right or wrong. It's a tricky sentence. It does not matter whether they succeed or fail. It does not matter whether their judgment is accurate or foolish. These questions do not touch the character, the life, that is being builded, <laughs> builded? Being builded by the heroic sacrifice and the splendid devotion which are sending gentle, refined, and cultured women into the hell of the police court and the prison. I have taken that case because in any audience you will find much difference of opinion as to the wisdom or the folly of the action. And I want you to realize that from the occult standpoint, the outer action is as the, the husk which is broken and cast away, and within the husk the fruit of the motive is seen. Nobility of character heroism and courage, perfection of self-devotion. And when you find people thus possessed by an, by an idea, so that no worldly argument suffices to shake them, then I tell you, by that great occult rule which many of us know to be the truth, they are approaching the gateway of the path. For the errors of the brain may be corrected rapidly, almost in a moment, but the building of heroism Devotion and self-sacrifice is the work of many lives of strenuous endeavor, and it is in that way that occultism judges of all these things in the world. The outer action is the expression of some past thought, some past emotion. The motive, of, uh, the motive for the action is what is all important. And so, looking around over the world, we do not judge the place of men by action, but by thought by will and by emotion. Those are the things that last, while actions rapidly pass away. I do not know if, without seeming for a moment to be too personal, I might tell you one incident in my own life, as a Madame, as Madame Blavatsky told me, brought me in this special life to the portal of initiation. As a matter of fact, it did, and it was a great blunder, a great mistake, and I mention it more willingly because it was a mistake, and not a thing that, as an action, was wisely thought or wisely done. 
The defense of the Knowlton pamphlet, backing up a wretched little pamphlet whose author died before I was born, which no one could be proud of and no one could like, merely because I thought the suffering of the poor would last longer, unless the question of population was allowed to be discussed. I know that in these days thousands of people are on that side. Then there were not. Oh, then they were not. Sorry, then they were not. It meant social disgrace, apparently social ruin, especially for women. And it was about as wrong-headed a thing as anybody could have done, looked at from the standpoint of the world. And that is why I mention it. Everything was wrong, except the desire to lessen the sufferings of the poor and the willingness to suffer for that object. But because that was the motive, because for the sake of the poor I flung aside everything that a woman values, therefore it brought me to the gateway of the initiation in this life. You could not have a more extreme case. You see, then, why I say that the occult rule judges of the motive and not of the outer action in which that motive materializes itself in the world of men. And it did not matter one bit that one of my earliest actions after coming into the Theosophical Society was to repudiate utterly the whole of that theory, logical from the standpoint of materialism, but impossible from the standpoint of spirituality. That was my test. Realize then, friends, that what you have to study is your motive more than your action. Make your actions as wise as you can. Use your best thought and your best endeavors to judge what is right before you do it. But know for your comfort that the eyes that scrutinize not the outer face but the heart judge by a better judgment than the judgment of the world. Give yourself wholly to service, keeping nothing back. Help wherever possible, wherever help is possible. Work wherever opportunity of work is seen. Give yourself to some great ideal. Follow it through cloud and sunshine. Walk by it in storm and in peace. And when the lives that lie behind you have flowered in this life into such blossoms of service, of heroism, of devotion, then, man of the world, as you may be, knowing nothing of the things of which we have been speaking, knowing nothing of the existence of the masters and the glories of the occult world, you are beginning to tread those first steps which bring you up to the beginning of the pathway, which inevitably will make you begin to seek the master, but he will have found you long ere you begin to seek. Though seeking be necessary in the lower world, although the consent of brain and heart down here be necessary and must be directed to the seeking of him whose pupil one desires to become, Know for your helping that the Master is there long ere you seek him, that the Master is watching whilst still your eyes are holden, and while you think you are only serving man, while you think you are only helping the downtrodden, the miserable, the ignorant, and the suffering, in the higher world where the judgment of the great ones is made, their sentence is pronounced, although you know it not. Inasmuch as ye did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. That is the end of chapter one of Initiation, the Perfecting of Man. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to give too much of my, I don't want to give you too many, too many of my words at the end of this chapter. I kind of just want to let you sit with what was read so that you get you come to your own conclusions as to you know what what this is suggesting in this book but it's pretty self-explanatory you know it's very self-explanatory in in my opinion um so i hope that gives you a good idea of the type of path i, I chose this chapter i read this book a long time ago and i left a note that you should do a lecture on this on this just this very first chapter and uh, i've just just gotten around to it now because I talk a lot on my channel about natural law and sometimes there's confusion as to what is meant by, by that uh, and the laws that govern nature, the, the laws that are in operation but are unseen. And so I, met, I, I make reference to that a lot and I thought it was good because this introduction, this first chapter kind of gives a general platform 
upon which you can start to structure your path to the higher life. And of course, I always target health and wellness because it's part and parcel, right? Developing and cultivating responsibility, um, being of service you know, to the world around you. But of course, in order to do that, you have to be in service to your own self, to your body first. I mean, you have to be, you have to have a clean vehicle of expression with which you may more effectively communicate and, and service the world around you. It's like, uh, I mean, think of it like money. Before you have money to just freely give away, you, you have to possess it yourself. Before you have, before you can give freely away love, you must possess it yourself. You must have self-love. Um, and I, I don't want to lecture too long about, about this, but you know what? I won't. <laughs> I'm going to let you guys sit with that. So in conclusion, I will say thank you very much for letting me read to you. Um, you know, if you're, <clears throat> if you're listening here on the, on the Free Melon podcast, um, yeah, I'd like to do, I'd like to do a lot more of these, of these reading sessions, or these, these story times. And yeah, if you, if you enjoy this, let me know if you find that this is something that's worthwhile, I will leave you. There's a link that I can leave in the description that will allow you to leave me voice messages. Um, if you are comfortable with having your voice heard or shared on the podcast, then that's something that I can do that I can include. And uh, I'll leave a link that you can, you can leave any kind of response or a question that you have in the description below. If you're listening on the uh, YouTube channel, then I'll upload this in the description um, that you guys can you guys can use if you see fit. So anyhow, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me here on the Free Melon Podcast. I wish you all the best, health, wealth, love, and happiness, and I will see you again on the next episode here on the Free Melon Podcast. Thank you very much, guys. Okay, love you all. Take care. Have a good one.